Welcome to this episode of Eureka, and we are going to have a very exciting conversation today. Imagine your police beat is in the patrol, and around three o'clock early morning, they find a car involved in an accident. It's a hit a road divider, and inside they find a very young woman with head injuries. You assume it's a case of accident, and then you bring it to the guest with whom we are going to discuss today, and he finds that perhaps it's a murder. We are going to have a very interesting conversation with Dr. Sanjeev Lalwani, who is with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and is in the Department of Forensic Medicine. He is also a registrar academic. Keep watching, Rekha. We are going to have a very exciting conversation. Before that, let's take a quick look at his brief profile. Forensic medicine is a subject which is based on principles related to medicinal science, natural science principles and the law. It also plays a pivotal role in criminal justice system and forensic medicine experts by using their scientific knowledge assist in legal proceedings which are helping in cracking many cases. And Dr. Sanjeev Lalwani is one of them. He is currently working as a professor of forensic medicine in Super Speciality Division of Forensic Pathology at the JPN Apex Trauma Center, Ames, New Delhi. After graduating from SN Medical College, Jodhpur, he did his Master's in Forensic Medicine from Ames, New Delhi in 2002 and immediately joined as Senior Resident at Forensic Department, Ames in 2002. Since then, he has been there in various capacities. Dr. Lalwani is actively involved in medical legal services at the JPN Apex Trauma Center Ames, focusing on autopsy work and also in clinical forensic services. He was the member of the team investigation in Nithari cases and Godhra riot cases. Dr. Lalwani is a fellow of various prestigious national and international academies and societies including Commonwealth Academic Fellow, International Medical Sciences Academy and organizes numerous training lectures and autopsy demonstration for participants from various academic institutions including the CBI. He has won numerous national and international awards and has around 100 publications in indexed journals along with contribution chapters in books. He has received Certificate of Appreciation in 2003 for significant contribution in organ donation. Thank you. You have seemed to have uh, involved yourself in a very, very interesting uh, profession. So let me ask you this question. Perhaps uh, most of our viewers, even I am kind of curious. When somebody becomes a doctor, uh, particularly a male, uh, one would prefer to be a surgeon, particularly a heart surgeon. Maybe in today's time, because diabetics is uh, becoming, uh, uh, you know, profuse, and then people are looking for solutions. Maybe you know some kind of lucrative or what seems to be like uh, interesting areas. But you have chosen something very, very unusual. How come? Basically, if you see, uh, the postgraduate uh, medical education is based on competition. So there is huge competition. Uh, you have to perform in the entrance examination and based on merit, you are asked to choose the subject. So I made uh, four or five attempts uh, after completing my graduation. And ultimately, I could see that everywhere uh, this forensic medicine was coming <laughs> as an option to me. And uh, ultimately, when uh, the option came to me uh, for doing post-graduation at Ames, New Delhi, definitely, I, it, was, it is basically a dream, dream for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, getting into Ames, so I thought that let, let me give some chance of uh, doing this MD forensic medicine, because every time it is coming in my uh, options, uh, and there is no other clinical branch available to me. So I gave this a shot and uh, got admission in Ames. Uh, after completing my three years, uh, definitely I learned a lot and I could see that there is a lot of potential in that particular branch. You uh, can help the society in identifying the crime. You can help the society by uh, providing them uh, the information about the cause of death 
and uh, simultaneously you have to help in police investigation so that uh, the assailant or the perpetrator of the crime is uh, punished appropriately by the court of law. So there were a lot of challenges in that and ultimately based, I, I accept it as my destiny that that's, uh, a, that's a very yeah, interesting it's a destiny that I, I can continue with. So this let point. me uh, continue in this uh, same stream like uh, one of the major case that you are involved was in Itari killing where quite large number of uh, kids were murdered right so can you tell us about that case and uh, what was it your role basically uh, as a forensic uh, medicine expert our role was uh, to reconstruct uh, the body parts which so actually what us. happened was that uh, they found lots of body part body in parts. a gutter yes, right yes. like uh, outside the gutter and people collected it and then police collected it perhaps right so yeah, it was not a basically a gutter it was just nala, a big nala outside uh -huh. the house uh, where uh, after killing those particular uh, children and uh, the women, uh, the bodies were uh, mutilated into different fragments and small, small fragments were disposed of in piecemeal in that particular nala. Uh -huh. So when this uh, case was cracked by the police, uh, ultimately uh, I, I issue was to recover those pieces uh -huh. of the bodies from that particular nala and ultimately there was a team uh, constituted where our own uh, residents and uh, faculty members were involved. Uh -huh. They took uh, out all these small small uh, fragments body parts which were in polythene and uh, they were recovered from the nala and ultimately all these uh, body parts uh, small fragments they were sent to aims for further processing that is basically like how to conduct the postmortem examination that I, uh, uh, how many individuals are possible with those uh, fragments okay okay so uh, even the, the number of people who were actually uh, killed yes. is something that you ferreted yes. out of this yes so how many individuals are possible out of these body fragments uh, male female uh, then children or adults uh, again there were issues that uh, what could be the possible cause of death in case we can find it out uh, establishing identity was again a big challenge in that so we employed multiple techniques uh, that includes anatomical reconstruction that include anthropological examination radiological examination and ultimately by way of DNA fingerprinting and superimposition technique we could establish identity of uh, see you use a term like for example anatomical uh, reconstruction what does it mean like basically that? like anatomical reconstruction is our body is uh, having a particular structure every body part is at a particular place so uh, like body parts are to be identified whether this part is arm this part is forearm this part is leg so we took out these fragments from those bags which were uh, given to us for our examination and then we could identify that okay this body part is of arm so it is something like a jigsaw puzzle Yes. Where you have only some pieces, but then you are trying to try to fit that and then imagine what should be yes. the big full yes. picture. So right? ultimately, we could uh, even uh, take on out, uh, take, to, uh, take out bones out of that particular uh, uh, fragments which were brought to us. And then we constructed skeletons as well, uh -huh. that how many skeletons are possible. Uh -huh. And ultimately, we could see that uh, at least uh, 18 uh, skeletons are possible out of this. So, so minimum 18 people would so have... We, can, we could say that, okay, out of uh, this, uh, these fragments which came to us, at least 18 individuals are possible. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then uh, uh, second issue was identifying whether it's a male or female. Again, we have anatomical parameters uh, differentiating between the two, which is more easy in case of adult because landmarks are more prominent. But it is a bit difficult in children because landmarks are not that prominent. Yeah, yeah. So how is this done? I mean, if you have a body part, I mean, if it is not, uh, let's say, your, uh, uh, you know, sex determining part, yes. let's say you have an arm or a piece of leg, then how do you decide that it should be male or female? I mean, it's no, not something that basically is... Basically, there are anatomical criteria, that, and there, there are differences between uh, the male skeleton and female skeleton. Uh, if we have a larger body part like skull, mm -hmm. pelvis, mm -hmm. a femur, so it is easy. Mm -hmm. If we go to the smaller bone, it is very difficult to now, identify. How do you differentiate in skull? Because I thought skull should be common for men and women. No, right? no, it is not. Basically, we have like a frontal prominence, which is a little bit different, chin. And then we have certain indexes, uh, uh, which are calculated based on dimensions of the particular part. Then we have uh, uh, orbits of the eye. And then uh, oh, uh, these bony prominence basically uh, are used uh, 
to determine that okay it could be possible that it is male okay. or it could be of female again further confirmation is to be done by way of other DNA, number of dna other. fingerprinting if it is helpful uh, particularly when we have a decomposed tissues it is little bit difficult then skull we have another technique that is superimposition technique if we have photograph of the individual we can use that particular technique in establishing identity as well okay in this uh, particular case where uh, you were involved i mean the whole team i mean i yes. suppose the whole department was involved because it's a very huge case what was the significant contribution of your forensic team? Of course, the normal thing would be to, uh, uh, you know, any any uh, autopsy you will be doing. But here, what were the major significant thing which helped the police in uh, apprehending the criminals? Right, ultimately, like one is that how many individuals are possible, that how many person could have been killed by that particular. So that also activity. will have an impact yeah. on the way yeah. the judgment is because given. Every, every case is different. Yeah. Every yeah. case was registered differently because a lot of people were missing in yeah. that particular area. So establishing identity will give assurance to the family as well that their yeah. case is taken up care of and then person will be punished appropriately. So it just to uh, uh, give uh, some sort of assurance to the family as well that uh, okay. uh, justice will be done to them. So, uh, number one was that how many individuals are possible. Then, okay, male, female. Number three was that whatever structure we have, we have to go uh, get uh, tissues or samples out of that for DNA fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. That was first priority. So that appropriate identification can be established with the relations. Uh, we were successful in uh, eight, to, eight or nine cases. Uh, and then in the small children where skull was available, we went with superimposition technique. Again, it helped in identification of some. So the identification is one of the important major, 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 part. And again, most important uh, issue was that age as well. That, okay, what could be the age of those particular individuals who were killed? So we, by way of radiological technique, uh, we could establish uh, the age of the person. Okay, what could be height of that particular person based on anthropological parameters? And most important thing was when we were examining individual pieces, certain trace evidences were also recovered, mm -hmm. which were also helpful. Like uh, in few cases, we recovered uh, hair clips of the females. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then uh, rubber bands, mm -hmm. uh, secret threads, and uh, then typical hair pattern on the skull, uh, that, that was also helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we have sweaters, uh, button, okay. uh, sweater buttons. Mm -hmm. Then we had uh, pink color of hairs, which were also recovered. So when we showed these evidences to the uh, assailant who was arrested, uh, he could identify based on that, okay, this bundle of hairs belongs to that particular lady. Mm. Okay, and that entire process was video recorded, which, will, which was produced before the court as well at later stages as, as evidence. So those small, small evidences which were there during the process of examination also helped uh, for uh, establishing the case in the court of law. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very interesting point and uh, this is where we will take a very short break. Keep watching Reka. We are going to have a very wonderful, very interesting conversation. Keep watching Reka. In our first segment of Policy Watch today, we will discuss how to deal uh, with the issue of pesky calls and texts. Blockchain is essentially a technology. It will ensure that the two parties actually do what they say will, they will do without ever being in contact with each other or knowing each other's identity. The complexity involved in the technology might defeat the very purpose. In our next segment of Policy Watch, we will discuss why India has the highest rate of online banking frauds in the world. The responsibility of the person who uses the card itself has to undergo a transformation. The cyber crimes, detection of cyber crimes, and the prosecution of the cyber crimes as fast as possible. The Reserve Bank needs to take a big call as to what extent you will allow cyber, I mean, online transactions. Second, how do you proliferate into it? If there are frauds, how do you deal with these frauds this is the biggest issue. Welcome back to Eureka. We are having a very interesting conversation with Dr. Sanjeev Lalwani, who is with the Department of Forensic Medicine in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he is also the Registrar Academic. Before the break, we were talking about one of the, let's say, a popular case, I mean, of course, a gruesome case, too, of Nintari killing. Let me now shift to the case where you were brought with a young lady who perhaps the police thought had died in a road accident. But then 
the whole thing turned on your uh, autopsy table, right? So, what was this case? Who was that person? What were the details? She was the journalist of uh, Asdak, Swamya Vishwanathan. Swamya Vishwanathan. Yeah. Vishwanathan. So, in, in that particular case, when autopsy was done, uh, because a lot of her colleagues were there in the mortuary itself, uh, and then uh, when we conducted our autopsy with uh, with assistant of uh, one of my colleague, uh, we when we opened the skull, there was a bullet lying in the. Skull. There was a bullet lying in bullet the lying in the But uh, people thought that it was a road accident. Yeah, initially, based on a preliminary investigation, it, it was. And then, like, level of investigation which is carried out in road traffic accident may be a uh, junior most police officer. Uh -huh. But when you have uh, cases of where uh, we have homicide or murder, then cases are handled by the senior most person. So again, all of a sudden things changed with the recovery of the bullet. And then level of investigation also changed. Uh, everybody was informed about this. And then things uh, t were taken up further uh, by the case, uh, by the police. The case was investigated. Maybe uh, not immediately, but after some time, this case was, case was cracked by the police. Uh, and then person was identified. The trial is still going on in the court of law. So sometimes circumstances are different. And when you conduct the autopsy, you find altogether different uh, cause of death, which is not getting uh, related with the circumstantial evidences. So that's a that's an interesting point. Uh, similarly, you were also involved in another case where people thought the uh, version given is uh, false. Yes. That uh, a Jawan yes. who killed a superior officer and also committed murder, yes. I mean committed suicide, suicide of himself, suicide. was actually killed by the, you know, other, that's what the kind of claim that was yeah, yes, going that, around. That and was the basically case the allegation. Yeah. In that so what was this case? I mean, can you tell us, first of all, the background? Like in this particular case, we were uh, requested by Central Bureau of Investigation because this case was investigated by them and CBI handles cases uh, after uh, these cases are investigated by local police and mm -hmm. in case of any dispute, uh, either state government take decision or the court directs uh, for further investigation. So uh, in that particular case, when we were shown certain documents, uh, it basically looked like that both have been killed by firearm. Mm. And uh, only pattern was uh, different, that person was, uh, this uh, officer was killed from front and then Jawan was uh, having entry wound here and exit wound from the top. So. When we examined the document, we thought, okay, let us visit the scene first and see how things... So what was the allegation? The allegation, uh, allegation was that was some that third person had killed both yes, of them. Yes, it, it, it is not a, a basically homicide-suicide. Uh -huh. the, the person was denied leave and then uh, uh, just to... Or maybe he was having some sort of a confidential information. Uh -huh. uh, that's why he was killed. Okay. So that it, it doesn't come out in, uh -huh. in the media. So th these sort of allegations which we see. So in that... Uh, Again, we constituted a team where we had a forensic science team, including ballistic experts, physics division experts. They were also there with us. So we went to uh, the crime scene in Siliguri, and there was a cantonment area. And we reconstructed based on the proceedings of the inquest, which were available to us. That, OK, we reconstructed the entire track. OK, person is standing at that particular position. If he is firing in this particular direction, what could be the trajectory? Bullet is entering at a particular site and then exiting from the backside where it, it can go in, in the room itself. So when we reconstructed... So basically, side, like, a bullet has to take a path yeah, according a trajectory. to uh, physics. So it is a trajectory reaction. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the entire sequence of events. So we, uh, based on documentation, again, that's documentation plays yes, very, very If it is poor, you can't do anything. But if it is meticulous, definitely it will help. So based on uh, documentation in uh, postmortem report, we could reconstruct the trajectory of the bullet we could see that, okay, where the bullet could end up ultimately in that particular room. And uh, when we were reconstructing this entire process, uh, we could see there, there is a wooden panel where there was some sort of a hole which is looking like as that of a bullet. So we thought, okay, bullet could have entered here. Uh, but uh, it was revealed that room has been renovated altogether in uh, subsequent years. Mm -hmm. And another army officer is still mm -hmm. staying there. Uh, who cooperated us uh, in, and helped us in reconstructing the entire sequence of events. But uh, we could remove that panel, of uh, wooden panel, which was there uh, in the, in the back, backyard uh, where bullet could have traveled. So when we removed the panel, we could recover bullet. Actual, okay. Actual bullet, uh -huh. which was 
further examined by a forensic uh, science laboratory and it was proved that it is the bullet which was fired from the same weapon which was used in that. Oh. So and ultimately we could also see that person who was standing outside, he has fired himself at the chin, a bullet came out from the top of the head. Uh, it has penetrated the wall. It was basically a cemented wall uh, where we could see there was a hole as well. So uh, be looking at the circumstances and uh, inquest proceedings, injury uh, by way of reconstruction, we could prove that it, it is basically what is the reported incident of uh, murder and suicide. Uh -huh. Okay, so we, we could prove it. And so reconstruction uh, is basically based on the documentation. If, uh, the, the, they should be perfect uh, so that you can uh, do appropriate reconstruction. But recovery of the bullet was one of the major achievement in that. Major achievement which uh, actually went to prove that yes. uh, it is from the same weapon that... Yeah. Uh, thing. So let me ask about uh, something about the forensic medicine per se. Okay. What are all the major areas within the forensic medicine? I mean, is it only that medical doctors are entered into the forensic medicine? Uh, again, we have two uh, areas here. Uh, one is uh, forensic science, another one is forensic medicine. So if we consider this forensic medicine, this is basically the subject which is uh, part of MBBS curriculum mm -hmm. in India. And uh, every medical college has at the Department of Forensic Medicine. Uh, who is involved in undergraduate teaching program. So all undergraduates, they are taught forensic medicine for at least one and a half year. Mm -hmm. And uh, this forensic medicine is only uh, in the medical, medical college. But yes, we have forensic science where we have many universities uh, who are running this uh, uh, master's course in forensic science. Mm -hmm. Again, if somebody wants to do super specialization, we have different areas like documentation, fingerprints, uh, serology, biology, chemistry, toxicology, uh, DNA fingerprinting area, physics division. So you are saying that uh, in Indian system, uh, in the undergraduate education, forensic medicine is part and parcel, but uh, most likely it's like a non-detail, right? Like uh, you don't really uh, put your heart into it. I mean, it's something that you're just no, you're clear uh, Like you have said that everybody wants to become a surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or a gynecologist or a physician or even a super specialist. Uh, definitely uh, people may not be paying much uh, attention or I will say they will not be putting much effort in uh, learning the subject. But we always emphasize uh, this subject is important in our Indian system particularly. Uh, and importance of the subject is most valued when you are actually in practice. Oh. Because then you have to interact with the law, you have to follow the law. We have now many uh, rules and regulations uh, like MTP Act. Mm -hmm. Again, you, you, when, if you are a gynecologist, you should know, should know the provision mm -hmm. which, which is taught in forensic medicine. Mm -hmm. If uh, you have a, a survivor of the rape or sexual violence, you have to conduct medical examination that is again taught in forensic medicine. You, doing surgery, you require consent. There are uh, areas which are taught to the students. So we have many areas which are of uh, practical importance when somebody is practicing the medicine in any specialty, which has to be followed. So they are taught in forensic medicine. That's why the subject is important. And uh, actual rea uh, reali uh, realization of this particular subject comes when somebody is really in practice. And then they, if you, you have not paid much attention, then people start learning the things and reading the books at later stages. So now coming to the forensic uh, science per se, I mean, uh, where do you think we are? I mean, in international level, where do you think the gaps are? No, in forensic science, definitely we need, the most important thing is we need to upgrade our forensic science laboratories. Uh, infrastructure, the technology which is used, uh, we have de definitely huge difference uh, uh, as far as technology is concerned, which is used in uh, developed countries and what we use in, in our country. So infrastructure, uh, technology, equipments, everything needs to be upgraded. So if you have to say some one or two technologies where you see a very wide gap, yeah. what would you put them as? No, basic thing is uh, instrumentation like. Mm -hmm. Uh, that one should understand that uh, to analyze a particular thing, what sort of instrumentation instrument is required. Uh, our laboratories, particularly in the state, maybe like Central Forensic Science Laboratory, which is under uh, central government, they have better facilities than state forensic science laboratories. But in the state forensic science laboratory, we lack uh, infrastructure. That is one. Uh, manpower because uh, workload is huge, manpower is less, and then uh, higher high end equipments. They are also required to perform analysis which is of quality and there is no doubt in the results itself. 
many times we see that things are done uh, particularly at poisoning level, uh, hi high-end technologies, they are not used. Uh, let me just understand this part uh, clearly because uh, that would uh, help us in uh, appreciating what you are trying to say. See, when you are talking about, for example, in poisoning cases, when you have a substantial amount of poison, your normal chemical test can reveal the chemicals which are present in your body. But if it is trace amount, then uh, the usual laboratory methods yes. won't help. Because every test has his own, uh, its own sensitivity. So what kind of uh, tests would give you those kinds of uh, details? Like, it depends upon, number one, that what sort of a poison. Now, we have facility which is related to common poisons mm -hmm. in many laboratories. Mm -hmm. So, uh, depend upon uh, the facility, they analyze these common poisons. But if you use high-end technology uh, equipment like GCMS, equipment like LCMS, definitely your scope of uh, like, uh, analysis. Uh, gas spectrography and yes, yeah. oh. yes, yes. mass spectrography, mass you know, spectrography. that kind of uh, yeah, yeah. equipments. Yes. So, so, again, then your scope is a uh, little bit wider. You are with the uh, Forensic Medicine Department and you prepare, uh, uh, let's say, a report based on, uh, uh, you know, the autopsy that you do and the information that you have and then you produce a report for the investigations. Yes. But then the uh, people against whom the case is registered may also question you, right? Yes. They may also ask, uh, yes. they may also say that this is not the only possibility that could have been also yes, a yes, possibility. Yes, yes, yes. That kind of, yes. have you faced any such uh, situation? Can you tell us some, uh, uh, let's say, incident in which uh, you had gone through that? No, this is the right of the defense. No. Okay, they, what in, in the court trial we have examination in chief which is done by the prosecution who has called you as a witness. And then uh, cross-examination is also the right of the accused or the defense counsel. So they can put questions to you. This is part of the routine judicial yeah. process. Sometimes you are able to answer those the particular questions and it, even uh, you can also refer certain books that it is mentioned in that. You can explain what you have written or what you want to say based on certain uh, documents or literature, you have right to quote that as well. But sometimes it happens that trial is going on and uh, maybe do, like even def in uh, one case where we could see that uh, defense produces defense witness, which mm -hmm. is again a doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's uh, appearing on behalf of the defense and he is also putting question on the report. Okay. So in that situation when some query uh, uh, is raised and uh, things are uh, creating any doubt, still uh, maybe it, it is again uh, the decision of the court whether to seek clarification or they can call someone as court witness mm -hmm. or uh, in the court to clarify that particular issue when mm -hmm. two experts, they are contradictory. Right. So we have a provision of court witness as well where court can call any of the expert from uh, any hospital or mm -hmm. uh, any institute. Uh, to appear and help the court in uh, arriving to that conclusion. So, uh, like sometimes we see uh, things are uh, uh, explained to the court and then somebody is there producing counter on that. Mm -hmm. And it's some, it, it is also a situation where uh, things ca can't be explained. Mm -hmm. So who is right, who is wrong, it is a little yes, bit yes. difficult. Uh, again, uh, we have to explore the possibilities. So sometimes we see, uh, in I remember one particular case where we, when we were referred, mm -hmm. Uh, about this uh, by the uh, investigating branch that this question has just come before the court and uh, uh, Can you this particular injury is uh, uh, unable, uh, uh, we are unable to explain to the court and uh, based on circumstances there is some doubt in that. So again we reconstructed uh, not actually but based on reports and uh, by way of animation. Now, now animated reconstruction mm -hmm. is also uh, acceptable things uh, if you see uh, as evidence in the court of law. And we have many cases in Western countries where animated reconstruction has been done and uh, has been accepted. But yes, there are guidelines which are to be followed. So we have uh, performed animated reconstruction in that and we could explain that, okay, even in the given circumstances, because of the movement of the body, after sustaining initial three injuries in this particular way, it is possible that last injury or this injury which is in question could be come in a different direction. Yeah, it is like what we are predicting it should come from one particular side, but it can come from other side because of the movement of the body. Uh -huh. Uh, again, we, we could we could produce uh, the things accordingly. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so that way, I mean, you can uh, give yeah, an explanation so, so, to the So court. again, reconstruction is exploring the possibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and we should be always open to every situation that, okay, th we can't rule out each and everything. Very, very important point. Let me now ask you a very different question. 
See, as a doctor, I mean, when you see a patient or a body for autopsy, I mean, you keep a distance. I mean, generally, you don't try to put your emotions. But there should have been some place where you really felt this should not have happened. Uh, as a uh, professional, if you feel that uh, this this can be a situation, then better give, or or, or you constitute a team where three four members are there, and it's a joint opinion of everyone. So I, either as a teamwork or. You do it with all precautions, like you take videography, you take photography. Uh, you, you take all precautions where you can justify the circumstance. But when you are inside the autopsy, you are professional. You are not related to anyone. You are not known to anyone. Thank you. I mean, it's been a very, very wonderful conversation and uh, very enlightening, too. I mean, most of us would not know much about uh, forensic medicine, except, you know, maybe some few scenes that is shown in film. But then it's a very interesting and a very important role to play in particularly maintaining law and order and also punishing the perpetrator of crime. Thank you, sir, being with us. I mean, it's a very wonderful opportunity. Thank you for being in the show. Keep watching, Rekha. We'll come back with another interesting conversation next week. <laughs>